Hello and welcome to the online ministry of New Westminster Christian Reformed Church. We hope that today's message will be a word of encouragement for you from our Lord Jesus Christ. If you would like to contact our church or our pastors, please visit our website at nwcrc.ca. May God bless you. Um, As we turn to God's word now, I want to begin by extending a very warm thanks to Pastor Mike for coming uh, and recording this sermon. Uh, Many of you will remember Mike when he was serving as pastor of preaching here uh, a number of years ago. I had the privilege of working with him for about six of those years and uh, am so grateful that he was willing to help us introduce this contemporary testimony, which he had a part in writing. And so uh, I'm just delighted that he can be part of this sermon series as we begin it together. And as he opens God's word for us now, uh, I invite you to join with us in a word of prayer. Let's pray. Gracious God and Father, because of your great love for us and our world, you have revealed yourself. You have revealed yourself as the one true God and King over all creation. You've revealed to us your purpose, your plan of not only creating our world, but healing and restoring it. We thank you for how that story has come to us in scripture. And as we consider that story, particularly through the lens of the contemporary testimony, our world belongs to God. We pray that we would find our place in that story. We pray that you would open our hearts and our minds to to know of your love and of your purpose and of the calling that you've uh, placed on each of our lives. We thank you that this morning we can welcome Pastor Mike to bring your word to us. We ask Holy Spirit that you would anoint him, that you would enable him to bring your word to us with conviction, with clarity, with boldness, and may all of our hearts be open to hearing your voice. We pray this in the strong name of Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Blessings, Mike. Great to have you here. This does feel a little bit awkward, preaching to a set of empty pews. But one of the things that has made this a little bit better is being able to be here on this Sunday and to see many faces and many people that we spent about seven or eight wonderful years together. We have such, Marnie and I have such good memories of this church and are very, very thankful for our brothers and sisters here. So even though I'm now speaking to empty pews, I know that this word will go out to you uh, whom we love. I'll come to you on this screen bigger than life. And for someone who is my height, it's good to be bigger than life. But I pray that even though it comes to you on a screen, somehow, more importantly, it'll be the living Christ that comes to you robed in the words of Scripture. The Christian faith is not simply about having a certain set of beliefs over against some other religion. Maybe that. But the Christian faith is much more. It is about the story of God healing and restoring and renewing his word world. It's about returning humanity to be what God intended them to be from the beginning. It's about the restoration of all of human life in the context of the entire creation. It's a story of God creating the world and sin messing it up and God setting out on the long road of redemption that that culminates in the person of Jesus Christ who reveals and accomplishes all the purposes that God has been working towards and opens up that opportunity for us to believe that good news and to become part of what God is doing to heal and renew the creation. And when he returns, that story 
will come to its conclusion. And the gospel is not simply doctrine, but it is the power of God unto salvation. When the good news of Jesus Christ in his life, death, and resurrection is announced, it doesn't simply come to our minds to give us new information and doctrine. He comes to us in those words to bring life the way John Calvin and Martin Luther liked to used to say it, that Christ comes to us clothed in the words of the gospel. And as he comes, he comes not only in love to embrace us, he comes in power to transform us. The gospel is the power of God unto salvation. <clears throat> Marnie and I have just been reading the Chronicles of Narnia, read all six of them this summer, and we just completed The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. And for those of you who know that story, you know that the Lord Christ is symbolized and pictured in that book by a very powerful lion named Aslan. And his majesty and power is recognized by all who see him. And I want us to picture that powerful lion, perhaps that lion imagery C.S. Lewis grabs from the scriptures where God comes as a lion and the lion of Judah is an image of Christ. But in any case, a lion is a majestic and powerful beast. And I want you to picture lion, this lion Aslan coming clothed in the words of the gospel. And as we are open in faith to receive and to hear that message, that powerful lion can transform us. But the problem is, the danger is, that the good news can be perverted and twisted and distorted by the cultural idolatry of our time. The gospel comes to us as the power of God unto salvation. But there's a danger that this gospel is distorted, twisted by cultural idols. For example, individualism reduces the gospel to, so that it becomes narcissistic. It's all about me. Or consumerism makes the gospel this religious good or service that is offered to bring us peace and make us feel better. Or the gospel is reduced by the rationalism of our culture and it becomes no more than a set of beliefs that we intellectually master. And so the gospel is distorted and reduced by the idols of our culture. To come back to the picture of a, the gospel or the Christ as a lion, the lion gets caged and these bars are the bars of cultural idolatry. And the lion is caged behind those bars and doesn't have the same power to transform us. It's only when the gospel is proclaimed in its fullness that its power is unleashed. I think it was Martin Luther that said that the gospel is like a lion. It does not need to be defended only liberated. It just needs to be released from its cage. And so what we, the gospel has to be released from the cage of the idols that reduce it and distort it and pervert it. And that's one of the things that confessions can do. Contemporary confessions can help to tear away the idolatry that hinders the gospel from being the power of God unto salvation. Confessions should never replace the gospel, never replace the scriptures, but rather they should be those things that tear away the bars that allow the gospel itself and the word of God to be liberated in all its power to transform the lives of God's people. I want to take you through, very briefly, three confessions from Scripture. The first is from Deuteronomy 6.4, and there we hear this confession. 
It's called the Shema. And the Shema comes from the first Hebrew word, which means listen or hear. And it, listen to it in Hebrew, in, um, in Deuteronomy 6.4. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Four Hebrew words. Yahweh. One God. Yahweh. Our God. This little confession became the founding confession of Israel and still is to the present day. The Shema would be repeated over and over again, I think three or four times during the day. And it was meant to be the confession that kept Israel grounded. Yahweh is one God. He is the creator God. He is the Lord of history. He's not like the gods of the nations that seduce us and draw us in to their service. He is one God. Unlike those gods, he is the true and living God. And Yahweh is our God. He's chosen us. He is renewing us. And he's going to use us as the means to bring renewal to the entire world. In these four little words was grounded their confession of who they were, who their God was, and how they were to live. And they would repeat that confession to stay grounded in a world where there were many gods. And they say, no, there's one God. And they would stay grounded in that confession that they were the people of God because he's our God and he's using us to bring renewal. That confession was meant to protect the whole of the biblical story so that Israel understood their role. A second confession is the confession that the apostle Peter makes uh, in Matthew 16. There's a... The books of the, the Gospels of Matthew and Mark are building up with a major question. Who is this Jesus? Some think he's John the Baptist. Some think he's a prophet. They can't figure, a lot of people are murmuring, who is this man? And Jesus turns to Peter and says, who do you say that I am? And Peter makes a confession and he says, you are the Christ, or you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. That confession, that little phrase, takes in the whole of the biblical story. He says, I believe that you have come, that the whole biblical story has come to its climactic conclusion. That you are now the Christ who fulfills the entire story. You are the Messiah who has brought the salvation that has been promised by the whole Old Testament story. You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And that confession can, uh, that protects the entirety of who Christ is and what he has come to accomplish. But then finally, I bring you to a third confession. A confession that was very important in the early church. And that is Jesus is Lord. It's found in Romans 10, 9. It's found in 1 Corinthians 12, 3. It's found in Philippians 2. This was this, one of the central confessions of the early church. Now that little phrase, Jesus is Lord could so easily become nothing more than a bumper sticker. A little phrase which, when you look at it, it's a nice religious sentiment. For the early church, making that confession could, not only could, it did mean death. Because you see, they were living in a culture where the Roman gods found their center, so to speak, and their earthly counterpart in the emperor. And the emperor representing those gods was considered to be the Lord or the kurios, to use the Greek word. And so to show patriotic commitment to Rome, 
often leaders, military leaders or tribal leaders, leaders in various parts of the empire were required to burn a sacrifice and make the confession Jesus is Lord. In fact, many people believe the book of Revelation is speaking of this is the primary danger of the Antichrist, that the church is being drawn into this and being called to confess that Caesar is Lord and to offer up this kind of patriotic and religious commitment. But the church couldn't say that Caesar is Lord. They confess, no, the Caesar only serves the true Lord, who is Jesus. And so to say that Jesus is Lord in the context of the Roman Empire was to protect the entirety of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now, we could now go through the history of the church, but you'd be very bored if I did, and show how various confessions have tried to protect the gospel. Sadly, they've often replaced the gospel, and that's dangerous. But we, we can see how they protected the gospel. But let me just give you one little phrase as an example. In the early church in the first 300 years made this confession. Jesus is one substance with the Father. Now, probably you listen to this and you say, that doesn't warm my heart. That doesn't make me feel warm towards Jesus. And... Of course. But you see, the Greek worldview, the way it understood the world, and we're not going to go into that, had a real problem with understanding how Jesus could be equal with the Father. And so, so many people in the church were putting Jesus as just below God. But this confession was made in the Greek worldview, in the Greek language, to say, no, Jesus is God and is one with the Father. Now, I don't think we need to go repeating, on, repeating those confessions today. Yes, we, the scriptural ones are ones that ground us in the biblical story, but saying that Jesus is Lord is going to be a little bit different today, or saying that he is the Messiah is not going to always communicate. There's a need for the church to make its confession to protect and to make the gospel come alive. We need our confessions made at many points in history and we need to speak the gospel to the issues and the, and the problems and the idols of that particular time. Listen to this quote by Leslie Newbigin, a man that I did my doctoral dissertation on. And this particular, uh, in this particular quote, he's arguing over against Anglicans who want to simply go back to the Apostles' Creed and continue to repeat that over and over again. And he's just made the, he just said in his writing, this is good to have these old confessions, but he wants to go on and say, but we need new ones. And listen to what he says. It is not enough for the church to go on repeating in different cultural situations the same words and phrases. New ways have to be found of stating the essential Trinitarian faith. And for this, the church in each new cultural situation has to go back to the original biblical sources of this faith in order to lay hold of it afresh and to state it afresh in contemporary terms. That's beautiful. We need to return to the Bible, return to the living gospel, to the living word of God. And as we lay hold of it again, how can we express that gospel in the 21st century in language that makes the gospel come alive in our day, which enables the gospel to speak to the issues of our day, which enable the gospel to protect it, to enable the gospel to be protected from the idols of our day. 
We need to lay hold of the gospel afresh, state it and confess it afresh so that it remains vital and living in our lives today. Abraham Kuyper, one of the fathers, uh, if you will, of Dutch neo-Calvinism that is very strong in the Christian Reformed Church, uses this image. He uses the image of a confession being like a pitcher that captures water for us. And what he's saying is that Jesus is like that living water. Like in John 7, when he stands and says, I am the living water. If anybody wants water, they can, living water, they can come to me and drink. Jesus is the living water, and that water flows from him to bring life. But it's such a torrent that what we need are pitchers to get hold of that gospel so that it can be alive for us today. But what he warns against, and this is what the main thing he's doing in this imagery, is he warns that it is easy for water to become stagnant. In other words, that water that that the pitcher caught in the first or the third or the fifth centuries, if we let that water just sit in the pitcher and then drink it again, it's not going to be fresh water, it's going to be stagnant water. What we need are new pitchers to take hold of that water again and again. We need new confessions to enable the church to take hold of the faith today. We need new confessions to enable the church to understand what it means to follow Christ today. What are the issues? We need new confessions to challenge the current cultural idols that threaten the faith faith today. It's in this context that the contemporary testimony, our world belongs to God, has been written. What they say, what the authors that wrote the first version say, it's got two versions, one came out in the mid-80s and the other one came out around 2008. The authors of that first version write this. They ask, What is the threat today that threatens our faith? And here's what they write. The dominant spirit of our times has various names, such as secularism, atheism, humanism, or practical atheism. Together, these forces form a real, culturally formative power, which restricts and opposes God's people as they try to live obediently in the world. If it takes a crisis to move the church to write confessional statements, and that's the point that they've been made through church history, crisis leads you to write confessional statements, then these secular spirit of our times has moved us to write the contemporary testimony. I think, I believe, and I would love to to take a long time to open this up. I believe that the humanism that is gripping North America and Europe and is now spreading around the world in globalization is perhaps the most dangerous foe the church has ever faced. That language I just used, I'm quoting from a number of authors who say that very thing. That is that the humanism that grips North America is one of the most dangerous foes the church has ever faced. And it's dangerous not because it comes to us to bring persecution. In fact, when the church is faced with persecution, that's when it seems to thrive and flourish. But humanism is a power because it allows the church to be. And it settles it into a nice, comfortable lifestyle. And very soon they've taken on the spirit of that age. And God is not, does not matter anymore. And the gospel is no longer central. And a lifestyle, a consumer lifestyle, has come to dominate our waking hours. I believe that the Western worldview is the strongest foe we face. And that's what the authors of our world belongs to God is saying. 
And so what do they say? What do we need to confess? We need to write a confession. It's a short one. You can read it in about 15 minutes. Let me suggest you do that. Let me suggest you read it once a week during this series. But they have a little phrase that is running through it that they believe speaks to the practical atheism of humanism that believes if there's a God at all, he's up there and doesn't have anything to do with this world. And that is this phrase. Our world belongs to God. Not to demons, not to fate, not to chance, not to the human mastery of science. It belongs to God. He created it. He is Lord of history. He upholds it. He is restoring it. And he one day will rule it, rule it fully again. This world belongs to him. And he is saying in the same way that the early church said, Jesus is Lord. Or Peter said, you are the Messiah. Or that Israel said, Yahweh, one God. Yahweh, our God. That we must confess this world belongs to God. Let me tell you why I like this document. I became involved only in the second drafting of it. Um, and even then, it was later into the process. So I loved this document long before I ever became involved. Let me tell you what I like about it. First, I like its narrative structure. It reflects the way the Christian faith comes to us in the Bible. It doesn't come in a set of doctrines and propositions. It comes to us in a story that begins in creation and unfolds through Israel to Christ and on to the new creation. And what you're going to find is this beautiful telling of the story in very helpful ways. A second thing is its missional emphasis. The largest section in our world belongs to God is on, believe it or not, the mission of the church. And it begins that section like this. Following the apostles, the church is sent, sent with the gospel of the kingdom to make disciples of all nations. And then it says, we, this mission is central to our being. This mission is central to who we are. And then it shows that mission is not just about evangelism. It's not just about going overseas. Listen to what the next paragraph says. The rule of Jesus Christ covers the whole world. And so to follow this word, Lord is to serve him everywhere without fitting in as light in the darkness and salt in a spoiling world. Our mission is to embody the good news in the whole of our lives in the whole of the world. And then it goes on to address the current issues of our day. So mission has to do with sexuality, how we live out our gender uh, and how we live out our sexuality. It has to do with marriage and family, how we live together in marriage and how we raise our kids. It has to do with education, how our kids are formed to live in this word world. It has to do with work. It has to do with economics. It has to do with technology. It has to do with war and peace. It has to do with politics. It has to do with all of these things, indeed all of life. And so mission is God's people sent into the world to be the new humanity for the sake of the world. A third thing I like about this testimony is its doxological tone. It has a beautiful tone. They hired someone to make sure it had a poetic and a beautiful tone that was doxological, that just didn't state things in dry propositions, but said it in a way that just didn't appeal to the mind, but expanded the heart. A fourth thing, it's in very understandable language. It's language that's, that children can understand and I'll return to that in a moment to tell you why that is so so important for me fifth it counters contemporary threats the things threatening the gospel today 
are things that are challenging a way of life that the, that the gospel calls us to. We're struggling with the area of sexuality big time here in British Columbia. What are God's norms creationally for sexuality? And also, the, one of the huge problems of our day is dualism, where we set off much of our lives away from Christ, and our, we, only, uh, have our, we only are able to love Christ in, when we pray at home or when we come to church. It says, no, we are to serve Christ everywhere in our work. Technology is destroying the lives of people. Our cell phones are having a destructive effect on young people in so many ways, and it deals with technology. The point is, it begins to open up the gospel in all the areas that are touching our lives. It doesn't speak to issues long ago. It speaks to issues that we need to deal with today. And not only contemporary what we might call social or ethical issues, but theological issues. The way it addresses things, for example, the way it speaks of election and the place it speaks of election is very beautiful. And we can look at other, I could take you to many other theological places in, in the contemporary testimony where it opens up beautifully what the Bible teaches. And so as it addresses current issues, it makes our mission and our discipleship relevant. In other words, the gospel is brought to bear on the issues of our own time. There's an Australian sociologist, not a Christian, who wanted to ask the question, why is the church in the United States and Canada and Australia and New Zealand and Europe shrinking and declining while the church in Asia, Latin America, and Africa is growing. And he answered it this way. He says, one, because the church has forgotten to pass along what he calls its founding story. They're not passing along the Bible as one story to the next generation, a story that has the comprehensive power to withstand the forces of a secular world. But then he said, secondly, they're not bringing that story to bear on the current issues of the day. They're leaving the next generation to flail about as they go to university, for example, to flail about and not know how to bring the gospel to bear on their studies, on the sexual temptations they will face, on the powerful technologies that will shape their lives. What they are not doing, says this sociologist, and he doesn't care. He's not a Christian. He's just observing as a sociologist. He says, what the church is not doing is giving the story of the Bible to the next generation and showing them how all of life fits into that story and how the gospel brings its light to bear on all of those issues. And then I, I finish with one more thing that I like about it. I'll call it its reformational or Kyperian accent. One of the things that the general, not the general assembly, the synod of the Christian Reformed Church asked when they decided to put this together, who do we put on the committee? There are three basic traditions, maybe we might say that, in the Christian Reformed Church. And one of the powerful ones, and it's even more powerful in Canada, was the Kyperian tradition. They made the choice to only put Kyperians on that first and that second committee because they wanted to have that accent in this confession. I'm thankful for that because that's the, that's the tradition I identify myself with, but it's also the tradition that speaks most powerfully to our post-enlightenment humanism. It's also, I believe, the tradition that's enable, that enables us to open up the breadth and the power of the gospel of the kingdom for our day and age. I've told you that I appreciate it. Let me tell you how I've used it. Our family used this in family worship for years from the time our kids were very small. We have much of this contemporary testimony memorized. 
We used to say this and we used to have uh, actions for it because our kids were very small as they were beginning to memorize it. And we would say these actions together and we would build up and sometimes put some of these things into song and to music. But it became one of the powerful things that enabled us in our home to disciple our children. This speaks beautifully to kids and it speaks also beautifully to teenagers. That's the second way I used it is in the university when I used to teach at Redeemer University College in Ancaster. In the first year class, they were required to sit down and read this twice, I think, from uh, beginning to end. You can read it quickly and then write a three or four or five page response to it. And here's the first line I heard, I don't know how many times from these students. When I was told I had to read a confession and write, a, write a, a paper on it, I thought, oh, no. But then I read this, and it is beautiful. And they would go on to talk about how it speaks to our day, and they liked it. And then thirdly, I've used it in the church. I used it as a teaching series as a young church planter. And when I was planning a church, and our church was very, very tiny at the beginning, we had a time of adult learning. And what was really funny is our adult learning class that was before worship was bigger than our church service. People were coming because we were addressing these many current issues, and they would come for this class and then go to their church for worship. I used it for catechetical training for, for, for kids. When I, had to, when I did that, uh, instead of using the Heidelberg Catechism, I used this. And I found that the students said this made the gospel come alive for them. And then thirdly, when we were in Hamilton and we began to see that church begin to grow and we began to see people coming to Christ who had no Christian background, we realized that the three forms of unity they could not make any sense of those. If you don't know what the three forms of unity is, ask Andrew after the service. But those three forms of unity made no sense whatsoever to the people coming in. We even had to, we even baptized a drug dealer who could barely read. How are you going to say, how are you going to bring the confession before them? We took the preamble, the preamble, and we said, this takes us to the heart of the Christian faith. Those who want to follow Christ, those who want to confess Christ and become members of this church, do you believe this? And we would deal with the preamble and make that profession. This confession has meant a lot to me. It's meant a lot to my family. It's enabled me to minister and in the university setting as well as the church setting. And I'm thankful you're setting off on this discipleship path with the contemporary testimony. It speaks a powerful word to our day. And it does so in the context of the biblical story. Just don't let this confession replace the scripture. Enable it to focus your attention back on the scripture and to read it aright and to see its light. Because the goal of every person who had a role in authoring this document did not want you simply to focus on this document. They wanted you to focus on the living Christ that stands at the center of his word. And if this study that you do in this contemporary testimony can refocus you on Christ and enable you to see his authority and lordship, the significance of his death and resurrection for all of life in the 21st century in Burnaby, BC, then all those authors would have said, the confession is doing what it was meant to do. May the Lord bless you and may your faith in Christ come more alive in this series. Let me pray for you, even though I'm praying for you two weeks or three weeks before you'll meet. Father, thank you for your word. 
Thank you for Christ who stands at the center. Thank you for his life and death and resurrection. Thank you that he now rules. Thank you that his spirit has been given. And Lord, may we submit our lives totally and fully to him to find true life. May we drink of the living waters of Christ. May we experience the power of the lion of Judah. And we pray that these conf this confession and its study over the next number of weeks would enable us to follow Christ more faithfully. In his name we pray. Amen.